I'd like to welcome all of you to Divine Mercy Care's first official live webinar. So our objectives tonight are really to understand fetal abnormalities as falling under three main categories, livable, treatable, and lovable. Now abortion is never necessary in all of those cases. In fact, there are great responses to these categories for a livable, uh, conditions such as Down syndrome, we want to offer care. For treatable conditions, we want to offer treatment. And for lovable conditions, we want to offer perinatal hospice and explain a little mm -hmm. more to you about that mm -hmm. uh, beautiful program that's offered here at Tepeyac OBGYN and at each right. of the certified for women's health care centers that Divine Mercy Care has certified through our new program, right. WHC. So in livable situations, Down syndrome most commonly, after the birth of the child, there's, there's really three different paths. You can parent the child, you can put, place the child for adoption, which like any adoption uh, can be a moral decision if done in the correct circumstances where the family can't care for the child. Or unfortunately, uh, the baby can be killed and the baby might be killed directly, directly murdered, or there might be an infanticide situation where the child's left to die, in this case, left to die from starvation because their condition wouldn't have killed them. Thinking that you can treat a child with Down syndrome, that's the kind of hope and the dedication to excellent medicine we need. And so, yes, we hear all the stories of how a Down syndrome lights up the life, the generosity, the joy that the child radiates, mm -hmm. the young person radiates. Um, but sadly today, most genetic counselors have gone from five to 10% thinking that it's okay to terminate and abort that pregnancy. 90% of children today, maybe 95%, that are identified with Down syndrome in the womb mm. of their mom are now terminated, mm. aborted. It's just kind of the standard of care. And it's so heartbreaking. But it's not our standard of care. It's not. And when we say parenthood here, we don't mean that these families are, are left in these uh, difficult circumstances suffering no. alone. We're walking alongside them. No. We want to care for them. We want to walk alongside them in the womb and then more people come along no. and walk alongside them through parenthood. So we really just want to emphasize hope here and, and love yeah. and community over and above the option of abortion for livable conditions. Once again, fear, anxiety is always with us. It's part of human nature. And it's trying to meet people where they are and accompany them with real compassion. Not just empathy, not just sympathy, mm. but real compassion, trying to walk with them. And that's ultimately what good care is. Finding resources, finding support groups, working, giving money to whether it's you know uh, the, the the Jerome Lejeune Foundation, what this is really what it's about, mm -hmm. walking with. And so now moving on to the treatable conditions after the birth of the child, really the best option again is treat and parent with the support that they may mm -hmm. need to have um, access to the medical care that the child needs when that medical care might not be available and in right. other countries we might have to provide a version of perinatal hospice for those children but for the most part in our nation we're, we're able as you said to continuously yes. find better and better medical treatments mm -hmm. and to give these children a, a wonderful sure. Uh, sure. treatment in this category would be say cleft lip and palate that's in that's a that's a surgical fix mm -hmm. but once again we're taking care of two patients I'm trying to diagnose mom's issues, but also we're using ultrasound and MRIs to look at the baby in the uterus. That means through the skin, through that extra weight put on, through the muscle, through the tissue, through the fluid. Well, it's a challenge to make those diagnoses, mm -hmm. whether it's hypoplastic one heart side. Remember, hypoplastic left heart is fixable. Hypoplastic right heart many years ago was not. And you really have to wait till after birth mm -hmm. to do the appropriate echocardiogram or the ultrasound of the heart and, make it and do it right on the chest of the child to make a better diagnosis. Because we must, we must always do good. We must listen. We must listen to the patients as well as um, listen to 
the data that we're gathering. How pathetic have we become that we're going to get rid of cleft lip and palate by um, getting rid of the child with the cleft lip and palate? You don't get rid of a disease by getting rid of a child with that disease. Mm. It doesn't quite work that way. No. And yet we're also now on the verge, which is another talk, talk, a talk, genetic engineering, mm. where we're using CRISPR to manipulate genes to try to prevent this. We're, we're living in a brave new world, and so many of these conditions, and I've done them, where an extra finger, we couldn't, the child was the terminated. Or right now, one of the more common things that maybe we all have had um, with our children is that little white spot inside the heart. Mm. It's called an, uh, an echogenic focus. If the baby looks healthy otherwise, all that is is a little reflection of a papillary muscle inside the heart, mm. which is normal mm. because we're catching it end on rather than lengthwise. There's more density. But if we find other problems, midline defects, breathing problems, lung problems, heart, it might be a sign of a genetic anomaly, trisomy 13, 18, 21. Well, everybody sees it and jumps, they go to Google, they jump to conclusions. Is my baby okay? It's a fear it, culture. Right. And fear is not of not just of the Lord, but in healthcare, illness, death is all about fear. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to slip into that mindset that I'm afraid to parent. I'm afraid to go forward. I'm afraid to get sued. And I just want to, you know, thank all our patients um, who have been so kind in these difficult cases and how have they have shown me what real love is, sacrificial love that goes through the fear. So um, moving to the third category here of fatal or possibly fatal conditions, such as anencephaly when a child's born without a full mm -hmm. brain, or trisomy 18, which is not always fatal, but no, certainly right. can be in certain situations. And so after the birth of, of that child that has that, that diagnosis, if it's actually treatable after all, it would move to the treatable category that we just discussed. Right. Um, but in certain cases, yeah, there may be some kind of treatment available, but there might be unintended consequences. And so, Dr. B, I'm hoping that you can dig in for us this uh, conundrum of these, these children that are very sick. What kind of medical intervention is appropriate? How do you make that call for these babies oh. of, you know, is... is <laughs> Is it when, when would you resuscitate the child? When mm -hmm. would you engage in a treatment that might be so aggressive right, that it right. might lead to system failure anyway? So what we're talking about here is not so much the trisomies because they are in and of themselves a little different case, but these are the, these are the cases where the doctor says, there are so many anomalies, mm. there are so many problems with so many systems, the brain is totally malformed. Mm -hmm. The mouth doesn't connect to the stomach. Mm -hmm. There are very few kidneys. The intestines are all jumbled. Mm -hmm. And the baby doesn't have a bladder. That child is not going to make it. And so we use the word a non-viable diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's non-viable. It's non-viable. Not your child is really sick. Mm -hmm. now, and that's the whole idea of behind perinatal hospice. Mm -hmm. When we do the best medicine to try to uh, care for the child in utero, and we find real problems, real sick, severe outcomes with multiple system failures, mm -hmm. we use the womb as a hospice, how we care for that child for as long as the child's with us, because we know that once we deliver the child, it's not gonna live very long. So this when is the not child is born. Yes. Like, for example, the child of our board chairman, Kathy Doherty, she's been very public with her story of her child that was delivered. And she was told that her child had a fatal condition and would not live past birth. She was pressured to right. abort. She didn't. She found the Kristen Anderson Perinatal Hospice Program at Tepeyac. And then when her child was born, they made a determination that there was something they could do. There was a treatment available. And in fact, her child is six years old yes. now. 
and they've had challenges and they've needed surgeries for, for little Maggie, right. but they walked through that as a family and they say she wouldn't have been here no. if they had listened to those initial doctors. And no, those kinds no. of miracle stories you know, are, are what people can miss out on. You know, it's the same, um, it's the same issue that we see with say like the Santorums who've been very public with their trisomy 18 daughter, mm -hmm. Bella, mm -hmm. how they've cared for her and they've kind of just gone the extra mile, but you know, she's with us and mm -hmm. she's Bella. I mean, she's her. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to, I just want folks to know that there are conditions that are just as serious outside the womb. And for those precious moments when the family is, once again, when this child is so sick that there's multiple system failures, do we really want to send this child to the nurse, to the ICU? For the, put, for the little time. For the say. little time that they have. We want to maximize the time with the child. So that's why all of these, um, all of these services that I know we've partnered with, with whether it's Laura Ricketts or mm -hmm. Paula Stryker or Be Not Afraid, there's many good groups out there that really want to help you walk as a family this. walk through this because it's not easy mm -hmm. to say goodbye, to know that when you clamp the cord, this is going to be um, the, the few minutes you have, whether it's minutes, seconds, hours, days. So there's one case here where these children are severely sick. Mm -hmm. The blessing is, is that we get to maximize the time with the family, mm -hmm. that these children are celebrated. They're not kind of pushed aside as monsters. When we give women the option of perinatal hospice, we, we believe that over 80% choose it. Yes. And yet it's very rarely ever given as a real viable option. And it's not something that most doctors have to really learn. It's just delivering the baby, as keeping the baby inside mama as long as possible, doing the best you can for mom and child. And then when you really assess that the child is beyond simple care, mm -hmm. beyond medical reasonable care. medical care, you allow the child to spend the, ma the maximum amount of time. But they're not dying in a neglected state no. where their value is up to discussion or where they're tossed aside or in a bucket or or no, any no. of that there, there's a huge difference between that attitude and the attitude of giving the child to the mother letting it be held loved passed around for the family i i don't think our governor or legislators understand perinatal hospice as the proper medical intervention mm -hmm. in the case of yeah. a fetal fatal abnormality i think uh, so many folks uh, it's just a con it's just a stand it's just known why would you do that you know, suffering doesn't have, you know, it's not part of a family. We but the to, irony is you know. the suffering comes even more when, when oh. women realize what they've done. Whether it's uh, Bernard Nathanson or whether it's Abby Johnson, once you see, or John Burchowski, or John Burchowski what you see um, on ultrasounds, um, it's, it's definitely um, a challenge in there.